Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Chen, and I am a member of Professor Xin Chen Yang's team. We are vascular surgeon from Beijing Tiantan and Fuhai Hospital. It is a great honor to represent Professor Shen here to introduce the research works on carotid artery disease in Professor Shen's previous hospital. So our presentation today is, should we perform post-stent lung dilation during CAS artery stenting? Carotid artery stenting, which is CAS for short, is a common and effective management for carotid artery revascularization. However, whether or not to perform post-stent lung dilation during CAS seems a twice told story. In the daily clinical work, different surgeons have their own choices as to whether or not to perform post stent lung dilation. First of all, let's learn the purpose of CAS. We believe that for CAS, the main objectives include re-establishing brain blood flow and achieving carotid artery plaque stabilization and to prevent its disruption causing ischemia cerebral infraction events. But not to obtain a satisfactory anatomic vessel morphology. However, for those who prefer to post dilation, when they found a higher degree of residual stenosis after stent placement, their objectives for post dilation mainly to gain a satisfactory anatomic morphology. They also may concern about compromising blood flow velocity and causing late restenosis. And more importantly, they desire to achieve carotid artery plaque stabilization, so they prefer to perform post dilation. Meanwhile, there are reasons why we choose not to perform post dilation. First of all, we worry about significant emboli risk because all stable plaques may experience disruption during the post dilation. And the post dilation may increase hemodynamic depression events and may prolong the hemodynamic depression time. As we can see, a carotid plaque dissect from a CA procedure is ulcerated surface disruption and the internal lipids, the necrotic corn and the thrombus could break through into the bloodstream and cause a serious stroke. And nearly a 15 to 30 percent incidence of microembolism was found in the postoperative MRA. We can see a lot of sediment like material captured in the umbrella removed from intraoperative post dilation of the cast. So that's why we worried further post-dilation of this may cause a stroke event. Let's look at the evidence-based data. In the 10 years follow-up of the CRIST study, they also, there was no significant difference in long-term restenosis rates 
between the CA and CAS. And the right picture showed that in the ACST2 study, there was also no significant difference in preoperative death and major stroke events between the two procedures. So this means that the two procedures being comparable in terms of effectiveness and safety. However, the ACST2 study found a significantly higher incidence of preoperative minor strokes with CEA and CAS. So what is the reason for this significant increase in minor strokes? Intraoperative TCD monitoring of CAS revealed that the post-dilation step was an important source of microemboli. And post-operative memory imaging also confirmed that the post-dilation may increase the microinfract sites. And in a retrospective cohort study of over 3,000 patients undergoing CAS, regression modeling found that post dilation increased the risk of preoperative stroke and death rates by 1.84. Taking this previous study together, this evidence implied that the less host dilation, the better neurological protection. Since clinical evidence suggests that post dilation may contribute to minor stroke, so the question is, is cast without post dilation safe and feasible? Here we check the 2022 ESVS guidelines. It states that the post dilation is not recommended in the cases of less than 30% residual stenosis. But what about when the residual stenosis is greater than 30%? We don't know for now, and there are no definitive guidelines or clinical evidence. The clinical consensus is that post dilation is required for post for stenosis greater than 30% to 40%. And therefore, we post a scientific question is whether it is safe and feasible when post dilation is not performed when the residual stenosis is greater than 40%. Here, we designed a retrospective case control study. We collected 191 CAS procedures without post dilation from 2017 to 2000 and 22 and for one hospital, which is Professor Shen's former employer. The aim of this study was whether residual stenosis is greater than 40% versus less than 40% increases the incidence of adverse events when post dilation is intentionally not performed. And five in-point events were included in the study. There are incidents of maze in the preoperative period and two years after surgery. Incident restenosis, hemodynamic depression events, dynamic changes in residual stenosis, and the last day cerebral perfusion.
for the measurement of the degree of residual stenosis after stenting, we used the NASCET method, which used the distal normal internal carotid artery diameter as the reference diameter, and the diameter at the most stenotic point to calculate the residual stenosis rate. The residual stenosis rate measured by this method shown in the right figure was almost 50%. Here we check the baseline data of the included patients. 191 patients had a main age of 67 years old and 15.7% are female and 39.8% had type 2 diabetes and 64.4% has hypolipidemia and 30% were symptomatic and more than half had combined coronary artery disease. Most importantly, 122 patients had their residual stenosis less than 40%, and 69 had their residual stenosis greater than 40%. In terms of lesion characteristics, 82% of lesion had severe stenosis and nearly 90% of EV3 protectants were used. Bifurcation plus internal carotid artery are the most common lesion sites. The overall severe calcification rate is 9.9%. We found that the group with higher than 40% residual stenosis after implantation also had a severe stenosis rate and calcification class. This suggests that the inherent characteristics of the lesion may determine the residual stenosis after stent implantation. In the whole cohort, the preoperative stroke rate is 2.6%. The myocardial infraction rate is 2.1% and the incidence of MACE is 4.7% and there are no procedure related death. The two years outcome, as we can see below, stroke rates after CAS was 2.9%. The death rate is 3.8% and the death plus stroke rate is 6.2%. There are also no procedure related death during the follow up time. Mm -hmm. By survival analysis, there was no difference in the incidence of preoperative and long term mass risk between the higher and lower 40% residual stenosis groups. This suggesting that higher residual stenosis did not additionally increase the risk of death and adverse stroke events. And this is the first major finding of our study. We performed long-term follow-up by ultrasound and the CDA. The entire cohort had five resinosis events during a mean follow-up period of 22 months after CAS. So the two-year resinosis rate was 4.5%.
there were two cases in the group with higher than 40% residual stenosis and two cases in the group with less than 40% residual stenosis. And there are no statistical difference between the groups. So our second conclusion is that residual stenosis did not increase the instance of instant restenosis. We also analyzed post-operative blood pressure and heart rate data. We define a heart rate lower than 60 or systolatic blood pressure lower than 90 or vasoactive drug application as a hemodynamic depressive event. That is HD for short. So it turns out there is a total of 38.2% of HD events but HD did not increase the duration of hospital stay or the instance of adverse events. In addition, we found an interesting phenomena that is higher residual stenosis has a higher risk of HD after case procedure. We then dynamically observed the changes in residual stenosis over time. The peak systolatic velocity on ultrasound was significantly faster in cases with higher residual stenosis in the first three months after the procedure. But this difference disappeared after three months later. And the right picture showed that the CT confirmed that the residual stenosis gradually decreased and eventually stabilized at between 10 to 20% within the six months after the procedure. So our fourth conclusion is that residual stenosis will gradually decrease and stabilize at between 10 to 20 percent. Finally, we compared the cerebral perfusion in the two groups by the airflow technique. It was found that there were no significant difference between the two groups in the parameters of the middle cerebral artery perfusion. Therefore, our final conclusion is that residual stenosis did not affect the degree of cerebral perfusion. So in conclusion, CAS without post dilation is safe and feasible. Our research work gave the evidence that residual stenosis greater than 40% does not inc significantly increase the incidence of adverse events. As we can say, two decades ago, post dilation was identified in the leisure as an important source of microemboli for CAS. And the subsequent studies aimed to confirm that post dilation was required for residual stenosis above 20%. But this threshold was raised to 30 to 40% over the years. So we believe that with treatment devices development, it may be safe and feasible not to perform the post dilation after CAS. And TCAR is a very good example of this. But we have to note that residual stenosis may cause hemodynamically depressed 
But we also found there is no increase in adverse events rates with post-operative monitoring. And our work has been published in the Journal of Vertical Surgery and uh, will come to be read and discussed. And Professor Shen's email is here. If you have any questions, please feel free and to share and discuss with us. That's all. Thank you for your attention.